Thank you, Ben. I realize this is a bit of a technical title, but I'll explain that. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it is a technical workshop, yes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in, in this uh, fairly French amphi amphitheater as well. It reminds me of my school days. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm going to speak about uh, causal modeling. And more specifically, I think the underlying uh, topic for this talk is actually something um, something fairly uh, more general, which is really using uh, hierarchical models, which have you know physical structure, with parts of those models which include machine learning, which 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 is one way of approaching uh, data analysis. And um, I'll try and argue that that's a that's a useful thing that we should think about for uh, future surveys. So mostly, I will speak about photometric surveys and some of their uh, data analysis challenges. Then I'll focus on one of them, which is photometric redshifts. And um, thank you, Alan, for giving such a nice introduction this morning. I'll, I'll go uh, over slightly different details. Uh, and again, Alan mentioned this morning that one of the challenges of photometric redshifts when you uh, use, use templates is actually the accuracy of those templates. And the accuracy, we need them for this generation of surveys. And actually, I'll argue that one can address that using uh, hierarchical modeling and uh, do some sort of self-calibration of SCDs and, and priors and broadband photometry at the same time. So this is, and, and this is uh, um, related to this notion of doing hierarchical modeling with machine learning for things that you, uh, it's not that you don't care about them, but you're not interested in their, their, de their, their detailed functional form. So first of all, um, I think many of us are, are here because we're, we're very lucky to have uh, big data sets. And with more data comes more precision on, say, a couple of parameters of interest. But also, um, uh, accuracy uh, becomes more challenging because uh, parameters or, or, or physics that you could previously ignore is, is now making a huge difference in the, the biases or accuracy of the parameters of interest. So there's this notion that you, know, you get smaller error bars, but also it's more challenging to get them unbiased. And so the, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this notion of accuracy, uh, notion of precision versus accuracy. And some of us have already mentioned that we're in the era of accurate cosmology now, which is uh, an interesting one. And accuracy usually comes with better methods, better algorithms, better data analysis, etc. So this is just a bit of a, a general, again, a general slide about the, the underlying um, um, notion, pitch, for this talk, which is really, I think, the future of cosmology will be an interesting state that we fundamentally care about very few parameters, right? Cosmological parameters or you know specific physics of interest, usually fairly simple models, uh, such as you know lambda CDM parameters, power spectra for CMB, uh, etc., which are naturally expressed you know in hierarchical physical models, where you know you can express those probabilities uh, in very simple ways. Uh, you care about the accuracy and precision of those parameters. But then there's also tons and tons of nuisance, what we call nuisance parameters, which means really things, things that matter, but things that you don't fundamentally, fundamentally care about. Someone else in different field might care about them. But for your specific analysis, if you do fundamental cosmology, you don't fundamentally care about galaxy formation. And those things are usually captured in more flexible or ad hoc models. And this would be, say, galaxy bias. This, this is usually modeled as a few parameters. And those are, you know, those are motivated by physics um, sometimes, but not always. And also, uh, there's, no, there's this interesting case that depending on the amount of data and the quality, the types of models that you consider, ad hoc, flexible models could be the right way to go. And so there's also, you know, galaxy bias is a, is a good one. There's, you know, Baryon physics, where some of us are very happily using templates or you know, cutting off small scales to avoid uh, the effect of baryon physics in large structure analyses. There's this is an idea that if you do cosmology, you don't fundamentally care about the photoses for individual objects, right? And so, uh, again, I'll come back to this notion that you, you, you care about few physical parameters that you know, causal physical modeling, and then there's tons of nuisance parameters where ad hoc, data-driven machine learning models uh, would be very useful. So now, 
what data uh, are we talking about here? Um, we're talking about galaxy surveys. The two extreme cases that we have uh, typically, there's lots of very, you know, this field is very diverse and there's lots of different types of surveys, but the two extremes that are typically seen are spectroscopic versus photometric surveys. So in a spectroscopic survey, you take very nice spectra of your targets and you end up with this beautiful you know, three-dimensional map of the large structure where each point is a galaxy. Uh, redshift is, is fairly well determined, type of object as well, so you, know, you, you're, you're, you end up with this uh, beautiful picture. For the photometric survey, you take broadband integrated views of those spectra, typically just a handful of bands, four, five, six for the big surveys. Um, you end up covering a lot more area, uh, a lot faster and a lot deeper as well, because you're getting integrated light, um, you know, you're using those very sensitive CCDs, uh, broadbands, so you know you actually get a lot more objects here, but of course, you know what can you do with a handful of numbers for each object? You get this blurred view where uh, the individual redshifts of galaxies are not known that well. Um, you actually go a lot deeper here, and what's interesting is that in both cases, the you're interested in the statistical properties of those distributions, and um, uh, typically, you know, there's regimes where both of those perform uh, better. And, and, and I'm going to focus on this one where, you know, visually you don't, you, you don't, you wouldn't think that you can do anything with that. But it's the beauty of statistics that, you know, there's cases where uh, you have a lot of objects where, you know, it's mostly noise. But actually if you add them up, you end up with extremely precise uh, measurements of parameters over their populations. And this is what we're talking about here. Um, so that's just a, a, a picture, because you know, all of us li like pictures, uh, of SDSS versus a deeper survey, DECAM. And the point is, the reason we're doing those surveys is, of course, you know, the CSDSS you know, has all this, this noise here, and there's all those objects here that pop up from the noise once you go deeper, right? And we're talking about doing this over thousands uh, of, of square degrees. So we're talking about going from a few million uh, galaxies to hundreds of millions, even billions in the LSST era. So this is significant. Uh, and this is why the jumps in precision are also uh, so significant. And um, even though um, the, the, the quality over individual objects might not be uh, th that different. So I also want to make a, a bit of a clarification here. So many of us, many of us in the room have worked on galaxy surveys, uh, hierarchical models. Uh, there's been a lot of exciting progress in this area, especially in modeling, you know, forward modeling uh, all the way from the initial conditions to evolved density fields uh, to, to surveys. Um, I'm not going to go in that direction. I'm actually going to focus on more on the, the, the data side, uh, the really dirty laundry side, and also the, the galaxy population side. So I'll try and, and show you today how um, to address this idea of getting photoses and modeling galaxy populations from you know, to galaxy to survey data, and how you know, eventually I want to focus also on, on getting foregrounds and modeling surveys in detail so that we can actually interface those models with all, all those exciting developments on the forward modeling, say, and body simulations or, or uh, large scale structure in, in, in general. Um, so one, I mean, obviously, you know, the reason this is a very active field as well is because we've moved from being statistics limited to systematics limited in those regimes, uh, multiplying volumes and number of objects uh, by you know, many orders of magnitudes. And we're, we're very deep in this regime uh, for many reasons. I'm just gonna mention some of those challenges and then I'm, you know, I'm sure many of you know uh, more than me on, on some of those topics. The first one is just very obvious. We're doing image, very sophisticated image analysis here. And it turns out measuring fluxes and shapes of very noisy galaxies, sometimes with you know, 10 pixels, uh, is very challenging, especially when you're gonna add up hundreds of millions of those and care about very precise parameters. So this is very, very hard, especially when half of your galaxies are blended in the LSST era. So, um, you know, this is left for, for experts. There's lots of exciting um, developments in this area as well. Uh, this physics that we 
still don't quite understand, which is intrinsic alignments, how galaxies naturally align with each other and with dark matter halos, uh, which is obviously a nuisance to cosmic shear, which is the distortions due to gravitational lensing. There's baryonic physics, um, and there's also, and, and I'm, I'm glad we're going to hear more about this this week, uh, the, the natural form, the distributions of those, say, summary statistics or, or just estimators that we built. Uh, there's been lots of advances in this area. Uh, Alan mentioned some of those, um, and we're, we're going to hear more about that uh, later this week. So I'll speak more about photometric redshifts and redshift distributions and how this is related to the accuracy of any underlying SCD models and priors. There's also those issues in image artifacts. Say you measure galaxies uh, near a bright star. Well, it turns out this affects the quality of your measurements. Uh, or depending on the survey conditions, you will get slightly different uh, estimators. And also blending is a serious issue. Finally, all of those issues are, are related to this idea that you would like to make a fake survey, right? Well, it turns out if you really want to make a fake survey at the image level, you need to sol solve all of those problems. And this is something that we can incrementally address with uh, hierarchical modeling. So now I'm going to uh, focus on, on photometric redshifts. Um, so We've heard about this uh, already this morning. It's really this idea that you know you, you observe a bunch of galaxies that, uh, characterized by their CD. You Doppler shift them and observe them through broadband photometry, uh, and you're trying to invert that process, right? You'd, if I give you say four noisy flux measurements, how can you infer the Doppler shift given that you don't know which one of those SCDs has been used? Um, and um, of course, you're going to use the knowledge of those band passes. You, you're using the SCDs if, if you have a, a, a set of templates for what you think galaxies look like in the entire universe. Turns out that's pretty, pretty hard. Uh, there's three classes of methods that are typically used. Um, template fitting is exactly what I described. You, you're assuming that you have some sort of model for what galaxies look like at the SCD level. And then you just invert. You just you have a likelihood function. You redshift those SCDs, and you 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 compare that to your data, and you you build um, a, a posterior distribution, multiplying the likelihood with a prior. Well, that requires very precise, calibrated SCDs and priors, as well as unbiased data. If you want to get that right in modern surveys, uh, it turns out it's it's very hard. Machine learning is, is a very natural way of getting around this issue because uh, you're now gonna, gonna construct a flexible model from spectroscopic training data. So you have data where you have measured noisy fluxes, you have the redshift, you're building a very flexible model um, for what you think fluxes as a function of redshift is. Um, now, those statements are a little bit um, a little bit strong because it really depends on the sort of machine learning that you're using. There's been lots of different techniques. Typic typically, uh, most techniques do not consider explicitly likelihood function or priors. There's ways where you can get those out, but it's typically not performed that well. And also, it does require formally representative data, and that's very challenging because you know, we're, we're astronomers. The reason we do those experiments is because we don't have deeper data, right? If we had deeper data, we, we wouldn't be doing all of that. So it's also very challenging because the those, those training data is spectroscopic, which I said earlier is, is much shallower. It's much more challenging to get a deeper spectra, uh, as deep as, as a photometric survey. I'll come back to those uh, in a few minutes. Something I will not speak about, which is, however, an extremely promising approach for uh, surveys, it's actually proved to be working uh, for some cases. It's, it's using clustering itself. So it's constraining the redshift distribution of a popula population of galaxy by cross-correlating it with itself, with other samples where you know the redshift, etc. And you're going to uh, use the spatial cross-correlations uh, to uh, and further redshift distributions. There are still still issues in this approach, such as, you know, it does require overlapping samples, of course. It does require an understanding of the bias of those galaxies. Uh, the cosmology comes in as well. So there's, there's subtleties which are not totally resolved, uh, but, w but will be resolved uh, very soon. So this is very promising. Um, 
There's reasons why this is not the final answer for uh, cosmology, and partly because you know this is bypassing flux models totally, like you're just not using uh, flux information at all. It's not telling you about galaxy formation, and there's, there's, um, you know, there's ways in which ideally you'd like to combine, say, template fitting and clustering uh, uh, for uh, what we're eventually going to do with LSST. I just, want to sh I just want to show you, really, what, what, you know, why this is hard. If you take three types of galaxies here and you observe them in the SDSS bands, I'm just going to apply Doppler shift here, not, not the actual luminosity dimming. So I'm, I'm Doppler shifting those three galaxies, and this is what you'd observe in you know, those five bands as a function of uh, flux, the flux as a function of redshift. Um, and now if I give you five noisy measurements in those five bands, you want to revert that process and infer the redshift. And you don't know which galaxy, which SCD was there in, in, in the first place. And you can try and do this visually. It's actually pretty hard. If I just give you the X coordinate here, you can see how the likelihood, the, the, the probability distribution that you build is not going to be that good. And there's going to be multiple modes because there's multiple types of galaxies uh, here. Um, so this is typically how it works. And this is a standard BPZ approach uh, that Alan described this morning, where you, know, you have a library of templates. Um, this is just a, a typical eight template library. You can add um, um, more, more flavor to it if, you're, if you want. Just ask me about this if you're interested. We can go through the different uh, flavors of, of template libraries and how they're, they're solved. But typically, you have eight templates. Uh, well, in this example, there's only three applied. Uh, you know, I, I, I've used a few flex measurements. You can see how the likelihood is for each type, so just take each, each type, compare to fluxes as a function of redshift, get those nice little uh, peaks. Then you also have priors that come in for what you think the relative probabilities of those types of galaxies are as a function of redshift as well as luminosity, which is the scaling of those uh, templates. Multiply those two, get a posterior distribution, add them up to marginalize over type. And you get this, you know, uh, beautifully multimodal <laughs> posterior distribution. Uh, now, the core of the problem here is that you're doing this for hundreds of millions of galaxies. Again, in which case, those small peaks here, they're usually much smaller than that, uh, will actually make a huge difference uh, for the resulting distributions at the precision you need them for. Um, and this is really the core, the name of the game here. It's how to get those at an extremely high precision uh, just to get the populations right. Um, now, <laughs> there's the way typ people typically approach that problem is you know, either just trust the photometry and abruptly recalibrate the templates and priors uh, using a non-representative training data, or do the reverse, tr trusting the STDs and recalibrating the photometry. Then there's all those questions about, you know, how many templates, what are the forms of the priors, because this whole problem is not totally physically motivated. Also, you know, there's those very subtle questions about spatially varying photometry, noise, uh, zero point variations, and the most important, you're, you're doing all of this on non-representative training uh, data. So, yeah, that's how I feel. Um, we can, however, try and address those issues. Now, before I go through you know, the natural way of addressing those using hierarchical model, I want to make a few uh, points about machine learning and physics. Okay, that's a bit of a <laughs> very general uh, <laughs> title. Machine learning in, in this case for photometric redshift. So, like I said before, um, if you had training data, a very natural way of addressing that problem is just to learn this very complex relationship between redshift and fluxes uh, without really worrying about SCDs or, or the details, the biases in the photometry, because the very flexible machine learning algorithm will learn that. This is great. However, there's one detail here which is uh, usually not considered, is that we, we know what Redshift does to SCDs, right? And so you're basically training functions to, f to fit uh, partly you know, those biases that you're worried about, about, but also what Redshift does to SCDs. So you're wasting time in training data just to learn uh, something that we, we know. Um, and so a very 
you know, idea that uh, an interesting idea that hasn't been explored that much is tr try and come up with machine learning methods that actually know that there's a latent space of SEDs and that those SEDs are being redshifted in a way that we know about. It's just Doppler shift. Uh, and, 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 and train that on data. And then the reason that's crucial is because it helps generalizing, extrapolating beyond uh, the training data, which is again shallower at lower redshift, et cetera. And there's clear evidence that those, uh, those approaches will actually help and make our methods more robust. Because otherwise, uh, if you take you know, vanilla machine learning method and train using standard uh, training set, you would see that you, you really get non-robust results, higher redshift where there's no training data. And that's because, again, the machine learning algorithms just don't know what's going on over there. There's no training data. They don't know about the physics of redshift, how those fluxes are more likely to evolve. Uh, we've explored that, that in, a, in a paper um, uh, last year with David Hogg, which was this idea that we can build, um, we can build, um, build in uh, this physics in machine learning. I forgot to explain that figure, but it's really this idea that you're, you're fitting a couple of data points here, and um, you can do it in all sorts of ways using machine learning, but what if I told you the underlying physics here is periodic? Well, you should probably try and fit periodic functions to that, right? And there's this idea that uh, there's ways of encoding known physics of relationships or manifolds in machine learning. So I'm just gonna uh, quickly go through uh, that, so we, we use Gaussian processes, uh, which is just the idea of encoding a prior, uh, a space of functions for the, a, a, a space of, um, a space of functions for what you're trying to fit. So if, if, a, func if a function follows a Gaussian process, it just means that if you evaluate it at two points, uh, th this probability distribution is Gaussian and it's characterized by a mean and by a covariance function. And if you have a Gaussian likelihood, so if your Gaussian noise on top of the, your measurements at those two points, then it's all nicely tractable and, and uh, uh, analytic. There's lots of very interesting results in, in this area, especially their connections to deep learning. Um, I'm not going to speak about that, but this is, uh, this is a very useful tool in, in many ways, not just in machine learning. Um, now, what we're going to do here is just say, well, actually, what if I uh, said that, that SCDs, um, I'm going to learn SCDs that are a Gaussian process, where you know, my, my mean function is a set of um, linear superposition of known SCDs, say your, your existing templates, with some error function, which, is, uh, uh, which has some covariance. And for this, I can take so some sort of smooth uh, there's a smooth uh, component, there's a com component for the line, emission line strengths. Uh, you can do all sorts of things. The key here is that um, <laughs> if this is a Gaussian process, because integrating an SCD in photometric bands is a linear process, uh, the fluxes are also a Gaussian process as a function of redshift. Now, this takes horrid forms, but the key here is that it is a Gaussian process. And you can actually, for some cases, analytically evaluate those uh, for some choices, or you can actually learn them from scratch. You can build covariance matrices that you nicely store for a set of photometric bands for a grade of redshift. And so now all you have to do is fit fluxes using a Gaussian process, which has a very uh, weird, non-stationary, complex covariance function. What this is really telling you is that, of course, you observe a galaxy at a given redshift, uh, with noise, if you observe that galaxy, well, if you're trying to make predictions for that same galaxy at a different, different redshift, um, the covariance between your predictions is very constrained because redshift is very simple and, uh, and deterministically applied to an SED. Uh, the point being that you don't need explicit SEDs. You just use a Gaussian process that has this very sophisticated covariance uh, and, and captures a latent SED model. Uh, now, I know this is a lot of jargon. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I I just, I'm just hoping to appeal to some of you uh, uh, for the Gaussian process part. Uh, so, you know, th this is equivalent to doing uh, two things. Well, to doing this, actually. To doing, you know, this crazy intractable way where, you know, you have a bunch of bands, the black lines here, and you fit SCDs, you, you Monte Carlo them with residuals, and then uh, uh, you would try and fit other bands and make predictions for other bands with it, except you're no longer doing this explicitly in SCDs, you're doing it directly in flux space using this 
complex covariance function, uh, which is pretty nice. So if I observe you know, those black points in a lot of bands, uh, this is actually using Cosmos uh, data. So I've observed this galaxy, which is actually at redshift one uh, in a lot of bands. Um, I can actually directly make predictions for what it would look like at different redshifts. And you can, build a you can build a photo Z estimator based on that. I'm not gonna go through that. But this is an example of how to encode physics in a machine learning method uh, that would uh, make predictions outside of representative training, outside of your training data more robust. Uh, and it, 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 there's evidence that it does work. You're actually able to extrapolate a lot more uh, um, a lot more outside of the training data. So hopefully this is something that is explored in the next few years as well. Uh, so just to give you a few more details on, on what are the challenges in this field. Well, like I said, uh, template fitting is challenging because the models are not complete. I've shown you eight templates for the entire for an entire survey running from redshift zero to redshift 1.5 this is very ambitious because we know that galaxies evolve with redshift that you know those populations are very likely to have variants and there's lots of details that are not captured by just eight templates right um, and those questions you can rephrase them in many ways uh, i like to think that probably a nice way of seeing this problem is that there's at any given redshift there's a mean template for a given set of galaxies with some covariance uh, as a given uh, as a function of wavelength there's also those those ideas that there's probably agn host contamination there um, and and that would also be a function of redshift and luminosity so all those questions are you know intrinsically related to template fitting i've mentioned spatially dependent photometry uh, including filter responses, uh, which will make a difference for LSST and, and dust laws as well, which is a huge challenge uh, for LSST. Image artifacts. Uh, Alan presented how to address that problem. If you do assume that the photometry uh, is is correct, but you're just you just observed a purely blended object. Um, so at the model level, this is very nicely addressed by this challenge. There's also this question is that there's, there's biases in, at the image level and at the photometry, which is more challenging. Um, and the final one, which I really like, is that if you do manage to build a, a forward hierarchical model for photoses and SEDs, then you will actually have a way of populating antibody simulations with more realistic galaxies and photometry, which is something I'd like to do. Uh, so, you know, many of us working in this field are on the spirit uh, where we have this dream and we keep walking on the treadmill. Um, one solution, which I hope we will hear more about this week, is obviously deep learning, all of that. Um, this will probably work. Uh, this is very challenging, though, and there are limitations to it. One of them is actually to learn about the underlying physics, how we would connect those forward models to, say, galaxy populations. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm very hopeful that this will work. Uh, another great solution, which I will not detail, but you should definitely check out those papers, is the phenotype type approach adopted by DS. Um, 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 there's, there's ideas of doing you know, forward modeling. Um, but again, this is not quite addressing the SCD and, and galaxy population uh, level. So <laughs> I'll show you the principled approach. I should have removed that, sorry. Um, the principled approach of doing hierarchical modeling uh, where we're, done, we're gonna try and model the data as well as the physics and solve the parameters consistently, which again was not done in this era, uh, in this area for some reason. I told you they were uh, typically calibrating the STDs or the photometry in, in strange ways. Uh, we're just gonna try to do that properly. Again, the devil is in the details. I'm gonna show you a specific example and case study, uh, but I'm hoping that this will develop into uh, generally useful uh, models. Um, I'll skip that. So we're, I'll show you what we did on uh, early uh, DS data where there was evidence that photoses were, ha had really s significant limitations, especially in the deep fields. And we didn't quite understand why, um, well, there were tweaks applied to the data and there was no clear explanations as, as to why. And we're gonna solve that problem using hierarchical modeling. And the, the feature here is that actually parts of that model uh, will include machine learning. So, 
what do I want? Um, I want accurate, precise Redshift of PDFs, which are interpretable with Galaxy, not really populations, but STDs and priors. And I, well, what do I not really care about? I don't really care about the form of the priors to the STDs, because again, uh, it's very hard to physically motivate those, those priors, and there's also it's also interesting to see if having flexible priors would help. And uh, again, there's this, this, this here thing here, which typically in this um, uh, field, people would casually add noise to the data in the sense that it would inflate the errors, the flux errors in some of the bands just because it makes the photos ease better. Um, now we want to explore that in a you know, consistent and, and, and cl clear way uh, and see if there is actually evidence that extra noise is needed when you're actually also calibrated the STDs. Uh, and this is where we're going to use machine learning because I don't, I don't know in advance what sort of noise would be needed there. Um, so the data set that we're considering is the DSSV. Um, this is about 20 million objects. It's fairly, this sample was fairly shallow in the sense it's just uh, similar to SDSS, but it, the individual measurements are a lot more precise. We're just going to use a 10,000 uh, training and 10,000 validation set, uh, which are unrepresentative, not in a dramatic way, but they're fairly different. If you applied machine learning straight to that, you would probably see failure modes as well. Um, but it's not that dramatic. So it's, you know, it's a fairly standard retro distribution here that you would use for cosmology. Now, the criteria that we're going to look at, again, are precision, accuracy, and interpretability, which is, again, the notion I really care about. I want to interpret those measurements in the context of a, uh, an interesting model. Precision, precision is just how compact my posterior distributions are for individual objects. And say, you know, those two objects, I would give you three methods uh, in those three colors here, and you see, well, the best one is actually this blue one because it's a lot more constraining on the redshift. Uh, and this model is actually the hierarchical model that I'll show you. The other ones are standard um, methods. And again, the, the accuracy here is how robust, how, how those distributions are actually, um, how accurate they are. And you can quantify that in, in different ways. I like QQ plots, which is really looking at uh, the confidence intervals of those uh, in, the, um, uh, in, a, in a training validation sample. And those should be diagonal. You want them to be diagonal because um, that would be, it really it means that the confidence intervals are robust. And finally, interpretability. I want to actually interpret where those peaks come from, which you can't do with the machine learning methods that was used there. So, slip. So if you use the BPZ, which is eight templates plus some interpolated templates, um, priors that were apparently calibrated uh, in one of the deep fields, not apparently, I'm, I'm just saying they were calibrated. Uh, I was part of that effort, so I'm <laughs> um, you, this is what you get. Uh, this is a standard spectroscopic versus uh, peak redshift estimate. You can see it is biased. Um, <laughs> pretty significantly in, the, in this field. It's a Cosmos field, so this, is, this isn't this is the full sample. In the full sample, this actually was much better. And remarkably, the, the confidence in intervals are actually fairly robust at low redshift. They're fairly you know, correct. And uh, however, they're the error bars, so the, those distributions are too compact at high redshift. And that's, again, a standard behavior for those methods. Uh, it's nice that it's interpretable, but again, uh, this, this isn't uh, correct for... Uh, this this is um, not accurate enough for cosmology. Now, if you use machine learning, and I specifically mean the Skynet methods, so those two methods were part of the official analysis for DS. Uh, this is using mixture density networks, which is a really nice approach in that setting. It's providing, you know, it's trying to come up with probability distributions, and, and it's a fairly um, good algorithm. It does uh, it provide really unbiased results in a broad range here which is a range we care about. However, it's massively overestimating the error. So it's providing d uh, d PDFs on the redshifts that are really broad. And I'll, I'll show you uh, what they look like. And, and you know, there's reasons why this is the case. Um, 
uh, but it's also quite remarkable that it's unbiased. And problematically, there's just no way you can interpret those PDFs because there's no SCD, there's no underlying SCD model there. Uh, now, this, um, this is really what motivated this whole work. Fundamentally, there's four sources of errors that underpin this problem, and actually most problems in data analysis and wh what many of us do. There's statistical versus systematic, as in, and then there's data versus model. The statistical data noise is typically called in statistic uh, aleatoric uncertainties, which is a funny word. Um, this is just flux, flux noise here. Um, then there's epistemic uncertainties, which is any sort of variance or noise and uncertainty that is in your model. And this could be, you, you know, the fact that I, I don't know the emission line strength that well for a, a type of galaxy, or there's an intrinsic variance in that population, right? So there's variance there. Um, uh, and there's also biases in both the, the model and, and the data, right? And we, we really want to address those four simultaneously because otherwise it's very hard to make progress in this area. And we, if we can actually address those, then we can actually help various other efforts in the survey analysis. So this is the model that I'm going to show you. I'll go through the results uh, briefly because, you know, this, this is a fairly uh, technical approach. I guess most of my points are, are, are uh, not philosophical, but you know, about a, a, a vision and approach. Uh, so this is the model that, that we developed. Standard template fitting would be here. So you observe photometry, you have a model photometry from a fixed set of SCDs, you tr you're trying to estimate the, SC the redshift and the type. Um, uh, for, for Alan's model this morning, you'd have a, a pair of SCDs and uh, latent parameters here, and you've, you've used uh, prior distributions. Now, I want more than that. I want, first of all, I want those priors to be prime tries with hyper parameters, and I want to recalibrate those. I want the SCDs to be, say here, uh, uh, SCDs with corrections, with additive corrections, as well as variants described in some specific way, all of those prime tries. And finally, I want to add extra noise, I'm keen to add extra notes to my data, but this will be parameterized, and I will solve for all of those parameters at the same time. I'm going to skip the, the details. Just ask me if you're interested on the details of how you know, the SCDs are parameterized, how the priors are parameterized. One of the points here is that we've tried various things. You can switch from a standard prior, um, which is this typical you know, rising exponential and, and fading thing, to a Gaussian mixture. Um, um, we've also tried all sorts of um, um, priors. The noise corrections, you can do very simple things, just add simple noise, or, or what's interesting here is that I'm actually happy to have a neural network uh, that will learn the relationship between uh, the, my data points and what sort of extra noise is needed in, in each band. And this is because, again, I, don't, I, can't, I have no reason to fix a specific form for what uh, the noise corrections would be. And so th that's an interesting way. And because we're going to solve this in a fully Bayesian way, uh, the, the simpler models will be favored. So that model will not start to go with very exotic corrections and using the full neural network in a flexible way. No, it will actually favor simpler explanations. So we're writing the full posterior distribution here. There's parameters for the SCDs, the flux model, the recalibration, the priors. Um, there's all sorts of fun details on how you, know, you can make that tractable. Um, we're doing this on a spectroscopic training data, but you can run it on photometry alone, which is an interesting idea. We're solving this using TensorFlow. So one of the reasons there's a, a progress in this field is because we have technology for doing those models uh, very quickly now. Ten years ago, it would have taken a long time to actually write this whole thing and, and solve for it. Now, in TensorFlow, this is just really a few, a few lines of writing those models and then solving using the best optimizers on the market, uh, which is really nice. I recommend it. I use it, I use it in all of my projects uh, now. So what's really interesting in this hierarchical approach is that you can just switch those models, switch those parts on and off, and uh, you know, flip and, and, um, and add more complexity or simplicity to those models. And so this is a grid of models that we've tried um, with you know, thousands of parameters, which is very straightforward uh, using TensorFlow and how they, well they perform. I'm just going to tell you what we find, right? That why this was useful. 
First of all, we find that this bias, this cryptic bias in BPZ cannot be eliminated without SCD correct, corrections and variants. There is a need for corrections, there's evidence for that. Um, as well as, as extra noise. As soon as you add extra noise at the model or data level, you get really good, accurate photoses. And there's also evidence that actually only a little bit of extra noise in the G-band is needed. There's reasons for why that's true, but actually as soon as you correct the SCDs and the, the, you add variants self-consistently, which was never done before, then you don't need to add any extra noise by hand, which is a really uh, and again, actually, using that approach, the Redshift PDFs are a lot more precise, and this isn't a surprise. Uh, I'm just going to skip the figure, and we can look at them if you're, if you're interested. Uh, also, the outliers are consistent across models, uh, and there's, you know, the fact that it provides, um, where is that? It provides a, uh, an interpretable model, right? I'm, I'm now getting out of this a set of calibrated SEDs and priors, which I can, I can then use uh, to get photos of these. Um, and yeah, you don't actually need more SCDs, you don't need very complex noise corrections, and those, uh, those questions you can only answer if you're doing that self-consistently using a hierarchical model. So I, I'm gonna finish by one last idea, which is, um, um, actually I'll, 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 I won't skip this one. Uh, You'll probably guess that there's, there's ways we can use machine learning in, in a more responsible fashion uh, here, which is, first of all, this idea of, of encoding physics in a functional form. There's emulation, which is very popular, a uh, very great way of using machine learning. And finally, uh, this is what we've done here, which is using just machine learning for parts of the model I don't care about. Um, that's fairly easy. Now, one final thing I've been working on lately is addressing this idea that we don't know, we, we can't tune manually what SEDs look like. However, it's interesting that physically, you know, there's a very rich physics of, of galaxy SEDs. However, uh, in any given survey, it's a very low dimensional space of mean SEDs as a function of redshift. And it's also projected in a very low dimensional space of five six band photometry. And there's one solution here which would be to develop data driven latent SCD space predicting SCDs. And it's similar to do using an encoding decoding or auto encoder technology here. Um, however, it's going to be solved using uh, variational inference and trained properly on spectra plus photometry. There's reasons why you couldn't use just out of the box uh, uh, auto encoders uh, here. So this is something I'm very excited about which would again help significantly uh, in, in this uh, problem. So I guess m most of my point was that I think cosmology will, will benefit, benefit from uh, this idea of using hierarchical models with embedded machine learning because it's a very simple thing to do and it, it will probably help. I've shown you how to do a self-calibration of both photometry and SCDs to do photometric redshifts and again very soon uh, generate self-consistently survey data at high accuracy. It's a really high accuracy calibration. What I'm going to do um, with this approach very soon is actually do, that's really simple to do, is to do redshift and luminosity dependent SCDs calibrated on uh, the training data, which again was was never done because of technological limitations, uh, and you know add AGN components and spatially varying photometry and blending is a, is a slightly different issue, but those three are are, are fairly simple. And in the future, we will have to care about uh, things like filter responses and image artifacts, and hopefully we'll close the loop and and connect all of those approaches with uh, obviously ambitious machine learning, deep learning approaches trained on on big data sets. Um, thank you.